در خدمت ویژن خلیلی هستیم از همکاران پرکار ما دلم میخواد که همکار بگم برای اینکه میدونم که همیشه در صحنه هستن به خصوص در کنار ما درود بر شما درود بر همه دوستان عزیز تلویزیون جهانی اندیشه و علاقمندان به ایران آقای خلیلی اینجا چه میکنیم؟ اینجا اتفاق مبارکی داره میفته برای نخستین بار ادمنستریشن یا مقامات امریکایی دارن معتقد میشن که باید با جامعه ایرانی در خارج از کشور در داخل کشور متأسفانه نمیتونن گفته بکنن باید در خارج از کشور گفته بکنن بزرگترین جامعه ایرانی خارج از کشور هم در امریکا و در عملا در لس آنجلس هست بنابراین این ادمنستریشن تصمیم گرفته که با مردم ایران صحبت کنه و بسیار اتفاق مبارکی من تمام اون کسایی رو که برای من تعجب آوره به خصوص این شورای ملی ایرانیان نایاک که عملا از همه گفتگوها با جمهوری اسلامی پشتیمانی کرد به خصوص در دوران پرزیدنت اوباما که معتقد بودن که محمد جواد ظریف و هستی با آقای کری و به طور کلی پنج به اضافه یک صحبت کنه و همش از این گفتگو پشتیبانی میکردن ولی در هفته گذشته با انتشار بیانی های مختلف چه امروز در لس آنجلس تایمز یک فول پیج آگهی رفتن 24 نفر که عملا شورای ملی ایرانی ها نایک پول این آگهی رو داده بود و با عنوان کردن این که امریکا داره صبات و امنیت اقتصادی ایران رو به هم میزنه این موضوع رو مطرح کردن و گفتن که این به پومپئو اختار کردن در حالی که پومپئو یعنی صبات و امنیت اقتصادی ایران رو در حقیقت حکومت استبدادی ایران استبداد مذهبی جمهوری اسلامی به هم زده این صبات رو اونا از مردم ایران گرفتن نه اینکه امریکا یا کشورهای دیگه و به هر حال این هدف شما از اومدن چه پیامتون چی هست آقای خیلی؟ من حقیقتا به عنوان یک ایرانی دلم میخواد که یه ایرانی که در امریکا زندگی میکنم دول بزرگ یا دول غربی یا هر کشوری در این رابطه صدای ملت ایران رو بشنوه چه صدای ملت ایران در داخل کشور چه صدای ملت ایران در خارج از کشور و اینا بایستی تصمیم گیرنده یعنی این مسیر رو ارائه بدن که دول جهان در مورد ملت ایران با ملت ایران صحبت کنند نه با دولت قاسب جمهوری اسلامی سپاس گذارم در خدمت دکتر حقیقی هستیم دکتر حقیقی درود بر شما درود بر شما و درود به همه بینندگان عزیز تلویزیون اندیشه میدونم که بسیار از بینندگان ما میدونن که شما اینجا چی کار میکنین ولی دلم خواهی که خودتون با زمان خودتون بگین هدف و پیامتون از اومدنتون چی هست خب میدونید که آقای مایک پومپیو وزیر امور خارجه امریکا امروز برای حمایت از صدای اعتراضات ایرانیان اینجا حضور دارن. و اکثر هموطنان فعال رو میبینیم با علاقمندانی که از امریکایی ها عضو کتابخانه ریگان هستن خوشحالی ما از اینه که بالاخره تلاش هموطنان ما در درون و جنبش جوانان ما در درون و تلاش هموطنان در بروم مز و رسانه های ملی امروز وز به نحوی رسیده که وزیر امور خارجه امریکا میاد میگه آقا حرفتون چیه؟ به چه ترتیب میشه با این مسائل موجود مقابله کرد و این یکی از موفقیت های قابل ارزشی است که به دست اومده من امیدوارم هموطنان عزیزمون از این فرصت های تاریخی بتونیم برای آزادی مملکتمون استفاده بکنیم حیامتون برای مردم ایران چی است؟ مردمی که داخل ایران و الان شما صدای اونها شده ببینید مملکت ما یه مقدار افراد همیشه میگفتن که باید چراغ سبز روشن بشه من میگم آقا چراغ سبز تمام نورافکن سبز روشنه وزیر امور خارجه امریکا امروز اومده اینجا راجع به شما و مسائل ایران حرف میزنه رئیس جمهور امریکا در هفته در توییتر خودش یک پیغام برای آزادی ایران میذاره با 
باید این کسانی که فعالین اجتماعی چه در درون چه در برون پنبه ها را از گوششون درارند امروز روزی است که چهل سال پیش یک آخوند پیر گفت وحدت کلمه اتحاد وحدت کلمه امروز باید همه ایرانیان در هر مرام فکری که هستن اگه علاقه مند به مملکتشون هستن باید وحدت کلمه داشته باشن و اتحاد برای پیروزی ضروری ترین گامی است که باید برداشته بشه ممنون که با ما بودید با اصل پهلوان هستیم یکی از اون شیر زنانی که همیشه در صحنه بوده اصل درود بر تو درود در شما خانم امانی عزیز و خوشحالم که در این جمع هستم دلیل اینکه ما باید مطلع باشیم و باید اطلاع پیدا کنیم که چه اتفاقی برای مملکت ما ما صدای زنان و مردان داخل کشور هستیم من فکر می‌کنم و امید دارم به این برنامه‌ای که امروز هست ولی باید دید که چه خواهد گذشت هدفتون رو فیلم کنم تو صحبتات گفتی ولی پیام چی هست؟ برای پامپاو چه پیامی داری؟ من پیامم فقط در اینه که صدای مردم رو بشنوه فقط همین چون ما که در خارج هستیم نمیتونیم تصمیم بگیریم ولی اون مردمی که در داخل ایران هستن و در کوچه های ایران هستن و در این شرایطی دارن امروز زندگی میکنن ما باید صدای نباشیم و امید دارم که صدای مردم رو فقط بشنوهن همینه بس ممنون که هستی مرسی زینا تهرانی یکی دیگر از بانوهای مبارزه در خدمتشون هستیم زینا جون درود بر شما خوشحالم مثل همیشه هر جایی که صدای ایران هست شما هست مرسی برای اینکه ایران رو میخواییم ایران رو میخواییم نجات بدیم در نتیجه باید همه جا واقعا هممون باشیم و خوشبختانه امروز روزیه که بعد از یکی دو سال کار کردن برای آقای ترامپ آمدن ایشون و من خودم تو این کار خیلی واقعا میتونم بگم سهم داشتم در البته کامیونیتی ایرانی که تونستم آقای ترامپ رو بیشتر معرفی کنم و مردم بیشتر گرایش پیدا کنن خوشبختانه ایشون هم انتخاب شدن و من خیلی خوشحالم چنانچه همه ملت ایران خوشحال هستن که بالاخره یک کسی داره میاد بهشون کمک کنه درست مردم خودشون باید با خودشون بتونن کار را انجام بدن ولی مهم اینه که کشورهای خارج حتما باید به این مسئله کمک برسونن به خصوص امریکا و آقای ترامپ پیامتون امروز با اومدنتون چه پیامی رو داری؟ چه برای مردمی که در داخل کشورن چه کسانی که در این ور هستن و چه امثال آقای ترامپ پامپا با اومدنتون در واقع پیام کلیتون چی هست؟ پیام کلیمون اینه که ما همه تشکر میکنیم از آقای ترامپ اول بعد آقای پامپاو که دنبال کار رو واقعا سریس گرفتن همشون و مردم ایران خوشحال هستن خیلی خوشحال هستن که بالاخره یکی اومده به دادشون میرسه و دست این جنایتکارا این آدم ها رو واقعا بتونن قطع بکنن مملکتمون به باد رفته باید به دادش رسی امیدوارم هر چه زودتر فکر میکنم تا ماه آینده خیلی چیزا روشن خواهد شد امیدوارم که مردم امیدشون رو نگه دارن با امید شما با همه چی خواهید رسید ممنون آقا مترن در خدمت خانم دکتر هما محمودی هستیم یکی از قدیمی ترین مبارزان که من میدونم خود من به ایشون نگاه کردم درود بر شما مرسی ممنون از شما من داشتم به دوستان توی خط میگفتم که من اقلا 60 ساله دارم برای آزادی زنان کار میکنم و 60 ساله که تو کنفرانس های مختلف بودم از بچگی پدرم معتقد بوده به تصاوی زن و مرد ما از خانواده باهایی می اومدیم و چیزی که جالب بود برای من اینه که تمام مدتی که ما در امریکا بودیم برای این کار می کردیم که زن ها مساوی باشن آزادی داشته باشیم و برای صلح کار بکنیم من فکر می کنم ما مادران باید پسران سلطجویی باید تربیت بکنیم که اصلا راضی نشن به جنگ برن اصلا راضی نشن که هیچ کاری بکنن برای جنگ و دفاع و اینجور کارا یادمه که قدیما ما حرف می زدیم که چه خوب می شد یک روزی که چون که برای مدرسه ها مادرها 
کیک میپختن که پول جمع کنن مثلا کامپیوتر بخرن که چه خوب میشد یه روزی که ارتش میگفتش که کیک میپختن که تو پتوفنگ بخرن ولی مدارس و بیمارستان ها همه پول به اندازه کافی داشتن و میتونستن کار کنن هنوز هم من فعالم در قسمت زنان مخصوصا خانم های ایرانی و خیلی علاقه دارم ببینم خواهرانم در ایران آزادی داشته باشند و بتونن به آرزوهای خودشون آزاد بتونن درس بخونن بتونن هر کاری که میخوان به طور تصاوی داشته باشند و بکنن در کنار عزیزی هستیم که دیدم در کنار خانم دکتر محمودی ایستادن ازشون خواستم که با ما هم یه چند دقیقه همراه باشن درود به شما خیلی خوش آمدید خیلی ممنون مرسی من سودابه اشراقی هستم از طریق جامعه باهایی لس آنجلس اومدم به این برنامه و سوالی هم که دادم در مورد این بود که میشه به انگلیسی بگم که بفا اوکی ای اسکت ا کوشن اف وات از دی ادمنستریشنز پوزیشن ان دی هیومن رایتس وایولیشن اگینست دی باهای کمیونیتی اف ایران اند ایم لوکینگ فورورد تو هیرینگ دی انسر هدفتون در واقع چی از اومدنتون و پیامتون به مردم داخل از اومدن اینجا چی هست؟ من به عنوان یک باهایی در سیاست دخالت نمی کنم ولی امید یک باهایی این هستش که همه قلب ها به هم نزدیک بشه ما همه از طرف مملکتمون ایران و نایی که هستیم در امریکا زندگی می کنیم همه انسان هستیم خواهران و برادر هم دیگه و بتونیم این مشکلاتی که در جامعه ها پیش اومده و انسان ها رو اینقدر از هم دور کرده قلب ها رو دور کرده و هم نزدیک کنیم و بنی آدم اعضای یک دیگرند اینو که ما از قدیم همه می دونستیم بتونیم تحقق بدیم بهش با اخلاقمون رفتارمون روز به روز این کار رو بکنیم در خدمت آقای پاشایی هستیم دوید بر شما آقای پاشایی مثل همیشه در صحنه خیلی ممنونم منم سلام می‌کنم به شما و همه بینندگانتون در سراسر جهان آقای پاشایی می همه بینندگان ما میدونن که اینجا چه خبره اما من دلم خواست که شما هدفتون و پیامتون رو از اومدن به این به اینجا بگید من فکر کنم دفعه دو سال گذشته هم کاخ سفید هم پرزیدنت ترامپ هم بعدا آقای پومپوک و جمهور خارجی شدن همشون تاکید میکنن که به حساب به مردم ایران تاکید میکنن رو اونها تاکید میکنن طرف صحبتشون مردم ایرانن و من اومدم اینجا من امیدوارم در این جلسه بشه واقعا پومپوک این گفتگو رو داشت که واقعا باید به صدای مردم گوش کنن اما من فکر کنم صدای واقعی مردم در داخل ایران ظرف 8 ماه گذشته بارهای بار شنیده شده و بارهای بار گفتن که چی میخوان در جاهای مختلف در شهرهای مختلف اون چیزی رو که میخوان اون شخصی رو که به تو مدیریت داشونه بارها بغدی من گفتن و بسیار رسا گفتن مردم ایران و ما در چنین شرایطی احتیاج نداریم که به حرف لابی های واشنگتن گوش کنیم به حرف کتان که در واشنگتن به حساب با خزینه های سنگین لابی میکنن برای خودشون به طور شخصی گوش کنی و بهتره که هم همونجوری که خودشون هم دفعه دو سال گذشته دولت آمریکا روی موضوع تاکید کرده حرف کف خیابون ایران رو گوش کنی و ببینیم مردم چی گفتن و چی میخوان و اون بهترین پیامی که میشه داد در حقیقت میتونم بپرسم پرسش شما از آقای پامپای چی هست دقیقا من پرسش هم که آیا واقعا حقیقتا با آن چیزی که گفتن عمل میکنن و اگر عمل میکنن یا صدای مردم ایران رو در داخل خی... در کف خیابون ایران شنیدن که زیر فشار به حساب جمهوری اسلامی به حساب بارهای بار اون چیزی که میخواستن چهارزار تا پلوی رو صدا کردن و اگر شنیدن به حساب تصمیم دولت آمریکا در مورد اینکه فشار بیشتری بر جمهوری اسلامی بذاره و کاری کنه که خود مردم بتونن تصمیم در... تکلیفشون رو تری کنن چه خواهد بود سپاسگزارم مرسی همراه Gentlemen, please welcome the United States Secretary of State Michael R. Pompeo, escorted by United States Senator Tom Cotton and Fred Ryan, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute.
Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this very special event at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. I'm Fred Ryan, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. As has long been the tradition at the Reagan Presidential Library, we begin our events with the Pledge of Allegiance. So would you please rise and join me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and please be seated. We're delighted to have a number of special guests with us this evening from the Reagan Library Board, uh, Ambassador Robert Tuttle, Robert Day, Robert uh, Day and his wife Marlon, Ben Sut and Sally Sutton, and uh, Governor Pete Wilson and Gail Wilson. And uh, Governor Wilson will join us after the Secretary's remarks to ask questions and answers. Also joining us this evening is a well-known star of television, stage, and screen, Suzanne Summers and her husband, Ellen Hamill. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> and although my role tonight is to do the formal introduction of our speakers, there's an additional person who's here tonight who I want to acknowledge and is someone who I hold in the highest regard and admiration. He's a colleague of mine from the Washington Post, and you may know his story. Four years ago today, as our bureau chief in Iran, his door was kicked down in the middle of the night, and he and his wife were taken to Tehran's notorious Evan prison. His wife was held in solitary confinement for 72 days, and he was held for 544 days in the most deplorable conditions you can imagine before we were able to secure his release. I am so proud that he's back at the Washington Post doing his job and that he has traveled far to be with us tonight. Please welcome Jason Rezaian and his brother Ali. Well, as we begin the program tonight, there's a special guest I'd like to introduce, and we're delighted as you can see, to have Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton with us this evening. In May, in May of this year, Senator Cotton said of Mike Pompeo, quote, he has a deep understanding of world affairs, a clear-eyed view of the threats to our national security, and key relationships with world leaders, all of which make him an excellent choice to be our top diplomat. That coming from a senator with a broad worldview himself. Senator, would you mind saying a few remarks? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Fred, thank you for those uh, very kind words, and thank you all for the warm welcome. It's an honor to be here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Library, especially with my old friend, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. I, I've known the Secretary for as long as I've been in public life. Longer, really. He was the first congressman outside of Arkansas to call me in my first race and offer his support. We became fast friends in the House of Representatives, not least because we took some lonely stands together in those days. Here's a lesson I learned back then that's important for each of you and for the Iranian people. When Mike Pompeo stands with you, you will never stand alone. As members of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, the Secretary and I traveled the world together. On one trip, we discovered the secret side deals that Iran had made with the International Atomic Energy Agency. There and elsewhere, I saw him in action with world leaders. I will simply say, his performance in those meetings did not immediately make me think, this man is destined to be our nation's top diplomat. <laughs> but, but top diplomat he is now. And that, there's another lesson for you. Mike Pompeo will tell plain truths to friend and foe alike. 
And to my, to my fellow citizens here tonight, and to the brave Iranians who will also hear us, you should know that in Secretary Pompeo, you have a friend and you have a champion. He will speak tonight about the diplomatic, economic, and military pressure that America is placing on Iran. Congress supports these initiatives. That's why I have legislation to expose the ill-gotten wealth of senior regime officials and to prohibit Iranian officials who take American hostage, including their relatives, from entering the United States. But Secretary Pompeo also knows the noble aspirations of the Iranian people to live in freedom and with dignity are not only a moral concern, but also a strategic imperative for the United States in our efforts to constrain this outlaw regime. The, the courage we have witnessed in the streets of Iran over these last several months both inspires us and strengthens these efforts. The Ayatollahs crave legitimacy, but the Iranian people will never give it to them, and the United States will not confer it as long as Mike Pompeo is our Secretary of State. Well, anyone who's read the news lately knows that our special guest this evening has been spanning the, glo the globe in his role as America's top diplomat. From Pyongyang to Kabul to Brussels to London and Helsinki, and that's all just in the last two weeks. <laughs> he, he's been active in advancing the many pressing issues affecting America's interests around the world. And we're pleased to welcome him back to the, the hilltop here this evening, perhaps, to see a beautiful California sunset and to be at the place that tells the story of the legacy of Ronald Reagan. In many ways, history repeats itself. As President Reagan knew when the Brezhnev Doctrine was in full force, there were times when the world seemed precariously perched on the brink of nuclear war. In the Reagan era, as today, regional hotspots and ethnic tensions caused instability and brutal terrorist attacks. President Reagan sought to combat and isolate forces of extremism in a quest to make a more tolerant and peaceful world. Well, tonight is something of a homecoming for Secretary Pompeo, as he's a son of Southern California. Born some 70 miles from here in Orange, California, Secretary Pompeo graduated from Los Amigos High School in Fountain Valley, where I understand he was the power forward on the basketball team. <laughs> which, <laughs> which has led to rumors that he might be in town to give some advice and coaching to our newest acquisition, LeBron James. <laughs> Mike Pompeo went on to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point, where he graduated first in his class. His, his five years of active military experience, including serving as a cavalry officer patrolling the Iron Curtain before the fall of the Berlin Wall. After leaving active duty, he graduated from Harvard Law School, where he served on the board of editors of the Harvard Law Review. He was elected to the United States House of Representatives from the 4th District of Canvas in 2010 and overwhelmingly re-elected for three additional terms. In January 2017, he was confirmed by the United States Senate as Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. He served in that position until this past April when he was confirmed as United States Secretary of State. Of of the many foreign policy challenges and issues facing the world today, America's relationship with the nation of Iran is one of the most important. And we are pleased to have Secretary Pompeo here, the Reagan Presidential Library, to share his perspective on this critically important issue. Please join me in welcoming Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Fred, for that kind introduction. Uh, it, it reminded me when I was going through my confirmation process, they were chasing down all the people I'd known my whole life, and they found one of the young men who played basketball with me at Los Amigos. And um, his quote was, they asked how good I was. And he said, well, he made the most of what he had. <laughs> uh, 
th thanks for the kind introduction, and thanks for hosting me here at the uh, Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Library. It's a very special place uh, and an honor for me to be here. I want to thank my friend Tom for joining me here tonight. Uh, he and I have been on multiple missions together, and I'm confident we will continue to do so uh, in the days and weeks and years ahead. And it's great to see Governor Wilson uh, here. Voted for you a couple times, a long time ago. Um, and I know we have many members of the Iranian-American community with us this evening. Uh, this is just a fraction of the quarter million Iranian-Americans in Southern California alone. Uh, we have many uh, Iranian-American guests from all across the United States here as well. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you this evening, uh, learning more about the situation in Iran as you see it, and understanding what your loved one and friends are going through living in that place. And I recognize uh, the Iranian diaspora is diverse. There are many faith backgrounds and many different walks of life, and that's a good thing, and not all Iranian Americans see things the same way. But I think everyone can agree that the regime in Iran has been a nightmare for the Iranian people. And it's important that your unity on that point is not diminished, diminished by differences elsewhere. To our Iranian American and to our Iranian American friends, tonight I want to tell you that the Trump administration dreams the same dreams for the people of Iran as you do. And through our labors and God's providence, that day will come true. Next year will mark the 40th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution in Iran. As I'll spell out more in a moment, the 40 years of fruit from the revolution has been bitter. 40 years of kleptocracy, 40 years of the people's wealth squandered on supporting terrorism, 40 years of ordinary Iranians thrown in jail for peaceful expression of their rights. Why? has the regime conducted itself in such an abhorrent way over the past 40 years and subjected its people to these conditions? It's an important question. The answer is at root in the revolutionary nature of the regime itself. The, the, the ideologues who forcibly came to power in 1979 and remain in power today are driven by our desire to conform all of Iranian society to the tenets of the Islamic revolution. The regime is also committed to spreading the revolution to other countries if by, if by force, if necessary. The total fulfillment of the revolution at home and abroad is the regime's ultimate goal. It drives their behavior. Thus, the regime has spent four dec decades mobilizing all elements of the Iranian economy, foreign policy, and political life in service of that objective. To the regime, prosperity, security, and freedom for the Iranian people are acceptable casualties in the march to fulfill the revolution. Economically, we see how the regime's decision to prioritize an ideological agenda over the welfare of the Iranian people has put Iran into a long-term economic tailspin. During the time of the nuclear deal, Iran increased oil revenues could have gone to improving the lives of the Iranian people. Instead, they went to terrorists, dictators, and proxy militias. Today, Thanks to regime subsidies, the average Hezbollah comb combatant makes two to three times what an Iranian firefighter makes on the streets of Iran. Regime mismanagement has led to the real plummeting in value. A third of Iranian youth are unemployed, and a third of Iranians now live below the poverty line. The bitter irony of the economic situation in Iran is, is that the regime uses this same time to line its own pockets while its people cry out for jobs and reform, and for opportunity. The Iranian economy is going great, but only if you're a politically connected member of the elite. Two years ago, Iranians rightfully erupted in anger when leaked pay stubs showed massive amounts of money inexplicably flowing into the bank accounts of senior government officials. And there are many more examples of the widespread corruption. Take Sadiq Laranjani, the head of Iran's judiciary. He's worth at least $300 million. He got this money from embezzling public funds into his own bank account. The Trump administration sanctioned Larry Johnny in January for human rights abuses because we weren't afraid to tackle the regime at its highest level. <laughs> Call me crazy, you won't be the first. 
But I'm a little skeptical that a thieving thug under international sanctions is the right man to be Iran's highest ranking judicial official. <clears throat> Former IRG officer and Minister of Interior, Sadiq uh, Masuli, is nicknamed the Billionaire General. He went from being a poor IRGC officer at the end of the Iran-Iraq war to being worth billions of dollars. How'd that happen? He somehow had a knack for winning lucrative construction and oil trading contracts from businesses associated with the IRGC. Being an old college buddy of Mah uh, Mahmoud Abdinejad just might have had something to do with it as well. The Ayatollahs are in on the act too. Judging by their vast wealth, they seem more concerned with riches than religion. These hypocritical holy men have devised all kinds of crooked schemes to become some of the wealthiest men on earth while their people suffer. Grand Ayatollah, Makaram Sh uh, Shirazi, is known as the Sultan of Sugar for his illicit trading of sugar, which has generated over $100 million for him. He's pressured the Iranian government to lower subsidies to domestic sugar producers while he floods the market with his own more expensive imported sugar. This type of activity puts ordinary Iranians out of work. Another Ayatollah, one of Tehran's Friday pair leaders for the past 30 years had the government transfer several lucrative mines to his foundation. He too is now worth millions of dollars. And not many people know this, but the Ayatollah Khamenei has his own personal, off the books hedge fund called the Setad, worth 95 billion with a B dollars. <laughs> that wealth is untaxed, it is ill-gotten, and it is used as a slush fund for the IRGC. The Ayatollah fills his coffers by devouring whatever he wants. In 2013, the Setad's agents banished an 82-year-old Baha'i woman from her apartment and confiscated the property after a long campaign of harassment. Seizing land from religious minorities and political rivals is just another day at the office for this juggernaut that has interest in everything from real estate to telecoms to ostrich farming. All of it is done with the blessing of Ayatollah Khamenei. You know, this list, this list goes on, um, but we've got places to go tonight. The level of corruption and wealth among Iranian leaders shows that Iran is run by something that resembles the mafia more than a government. On foreign policy, the regime's mission of exporting the revolution is to produce a decades-long campaign of ideologically motivated violence and destabilization abroad. Assad, Lebanese Hezbollah, Hamas, Shia militant groups in Iraq and the Houthis in Yemen feed on billions of regime cash, while the Iranian people shout slogans like, leave Syria, think about us. Our partners in the Middle East are plagued by Iranian cyber attacks and threatening behavior in the waters of the Persian Gulf. The regime and its allies in terror have left a trail of dissident blood across Europe and the Middle East. Indeed, our European allies are not immune to the threat of regime-backed terrorism. Just earlier this month, an Iranian diplomat based in Vienna was arrested and charged with supplying explosives for a terrorist bomb at a, to, scheduled to bomb a political rally in France. This tells you everything you need to know about the regime. At the same time, they're trying to convince Europe to stay in the nuclear deal. They're covertly plotting terrorist attacks in the heart of Europe. And because fighting the United States and destroying Israel is at the core of the regime's ideology, it has committed and supported many acts of violence and terrorism against both countries and our citizens. As just one example, well over a thousand American service members have been killed and wounded in Iraq from Iranian-made IEDs. Today, multiple Americans are detained and missing inside of Iran. Bakr Namazi, Siamak Namazi, Xiu Wang are unjustly held by the regime to this day. And Bob Levinson has been missing in Iran for over 11 years. There are others too. And we in the Trump administration are working diligently to bring each of those Americans home for having been wrongfully detained for far too long. Despite, despite the regimes,
you. If, if, if there, if there were, if there were only so much freedom of expression in Iran. You know, <laughs> despite the regime's clear record of aggression, America and other countries have spent years straining to identify a political moderate. It's like an Iranian unicorn. <laughs> the regime's revolutionary goals and willingness to commit violent acts haven't produced anyone to lead Iran that can be remotely called a moderate or a statesman. Some believe that President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif fit that bill. The truth is, they are merely polished front men for the Ayatollah's international con artistry. Their nuclear deal didn't make them moderates, it made them wolves in sheep's clothing. Governments around the world worry that confronting the Islamic Republic harms the cause of moderates, but these so-called moderates within the regime are still violent Islamic revolutionaries with an anti-America, anti-West agenda. You only have to take their own words for it. And for that matter, the evidence reveals that their agenda is as anti-Iran agenda as well. The regime's absolute adherence to the Islamic revolutions means it cannot endure any ideas in the Iranian society that would contradict or undermine it, unlike we just did here this evening. It's why the regime has for decades heartlessly repressed its own people's human rights, dignity, and fundamental freedoms. It's why the Iranian police detained a teenage Iranian gymnast for posting an Instagram video of herself dancing. It's why the regime arrests hundreds of, of Azawahis, members of Iran's minority Arab community, when they speak out to demand respect for their language and for their basic beliefs. The government's morality police beat women in the streets and arrest those who do not wish to wear the hijab. On White Wednesday, activists recently, one activist was recently sentenced to 20 years in prison for a protest in compulsory hijab wearing. The desire to uphold the Islamic resolution has especially resulted in gross suppression of the freedom of religion in Iran, often to barbaric ends. Last month, a simple man, a bus driver, a father of two children, and a member of the Iranian uh, Gobadi Sufi dervish community was convicted and sentenced to death. His sentence came on questionable grounds, following violent clashes between security forces and the dervishes. He was reportedly denied access to a lawyer before, during his, before and during his grossly unfair trial. This man, Mr. Salas, and his supporters maintains his innocence throughout, reportedly stating he'd been tortured into a forced convention, confession. Sadly, on June 18th, the regime hanged Mr. Salas in prison. His death was part of a larger crackdown that began in February when at least 300 Sufis demanding the release of their fellow faith members was un were unjustly arrested. Right now, hundreds of Sufi Muslims in Iran remain in prison on account of their religious beliefs, with reports of several having died at the hands of the regime's brutal security forces. Among those in prison is the 91-year-old leader, Dr. Nur Ali Tabanda, who has been under house arrest for at least the last part of four months, the greatest part of four months. He's in need of immediate medical care. The religious intolerance of the regime in Iran does not only extend to Sufi Muslims. The same goes for Christians and Jews and Sunnis and Baha'is and Zoroastrians and members of many other groups inside of Iran who live with the fear that their next prayer may be indeed their last. What grieves us so badly about the treatment of religious minorities in Iran is that their presence far predates the regime. Is that their presence far predates the regime. They are a historic part of the rich fabric of an ancient and vibrant, vibrant Iranian civilization. That fabric has been torn by intolerant, black-robed enforcers. When other faiths are suppressed, the image of Iran becomes a self-portrait of the Ayatollahs and of the IRGC. In response to myriad government failures, corruption, and disrespect of rights, since December, Iranians have been taken to the streets in the most enduring and forceful protest since 1979. Some shout the slogan, the people are paupers while the mullahs live like gods. Others choose to shut down the Grand Bazaar in Tehran. The specific grievances do differ, but all those voicing dissatisfaction share one thing. 
They have been ill-treated by a revolutionary regime. Iranians want to be governed with dignity, accountability, and respect. The, the regime, the, this is important, the, the regime's brutal response to these peaceful protests reflects the intolerance that its revolutionary worldview has produced. Last January, the regime welcomed in the new year with the arrest of up to 5,000 of its own people. They were peacefully calling for a better life. Hundreds reportedly remain behind bars and several are dead at the hands of their own government. The leaders cynically call it suicide. Overall, it's clear. The regime's ideology has led many Iranians to be angry. They cannot call their homeland a normal country. They know that a constitution that enshrines the export of Islamic revolution and the destruction of its neighbors and the restriction of citizenship is not normal. Ordinary Iranians know that their government's torture of its own people is not normal. Earning multiple rounds of sanction by the UN Security Council is not normal. Inciting chants of death to America and death to Israel is not normal. Being the number one state sponsor of terror is similarly abnormal. Sometimes it seems the world has become desensitized to the regime's authoritarianism at home and its campaigns of violence abroad. But the proud Iranian people are not staying silent about their government's many abuses. And the United States under President Trump will not stay silent either. In light of these protests and 40 years of regime tyranny, I have a message for the people of Iran. The, the United States hears you. The United States supports you. The United States is with you. When the United States sees the shoots of liberty pushing up through rocky soil, we pledge our solidarity because we too took a hard first step towards becoming a free country a few years back. Right now, the United States is undertaking a diplomatic and financial pressure campaign to cut off the funds that the regime uses to enrich itself and support death and destruction. We have an obligation to put maximum pressure on the regime's ability to generate and move money, and we will do so. At the center of this campaign is the reimposition of sanction on Iran's banking and energy sectors. As we've explained over the last few weeks, our focus is to work with countries importing Iranian crude oil to get imports as close to zero as possible by November 4th. Zero. <laughs> recently, recently as part of this campaign, we designated the Bahraini Shia militia uh, terrorist organization Saraya al-Ashtar, and with the UAE, we have jointly disrupted a currency exchange network that was transferring millions of dollars to the IRGC. And there's more to come. Regime leaders, especially those at the top of the IRGC and the Quds Force, like Qasem Soleimani, must be made to feel the painful consequences of their bad decision making. We, we are asking every nation, every nation who is sick and tired of the Islamic Republic's destructive behavior to join our pressure campaign. This especially goes for our allies in the Middle East and Europe people who have themselves been terrorized by the violent regime's activity for decades. And you should know that the United States is not afraid to spread our message on the airwaves and online inside of Iran either. For, for 40 years, the Iranian people have heard from their leaders that America is the great Satan. We do not believe they're interested in hearing the fake news any longer. Today, Today, one in four Iranians, 14 million people, watches or listens to U.S. government broad broadcasts each week. And it's more important than ever now to refute the regime's lies and repeat our deep desire for friendship with the Iranian people. Right now, our U.S. Board, Broadcasting Board of Governors is taking new steps to help Iranians get around internet censorship as well. The BBG is launching a new 24-7 Farsi language TV channel it will expand not only television, but radio, digital, and social media format, so that the ordinary Iranians inside of Iran and around the globe can know that America stands with them. Yeah. And finally, and finally, America is unafraid to expose human rights violations and support those who are being silenced. 
We continue to raise our concerns over the Islamic Republic's dire record of human rights abuses each time we speak at the UN and with our partners who maintain diplomatic relations with that country. We make it clear that the world is watching, and as the regime continues to make its own people the longest suffering victims, we will not stand silent. And now, and now we call on everyone here in the audience and our international partners to help us shine a spotlight on the regime's abuses and to support the Iranian people. The goal of our efforts is to one day see Iranians in Iran enjoying the same quality of life that Iranians in America enjoy. <laughs> Iranians in America enjoy all the freedoms secured by their government, not trampled by it. They're free to pursue economic opportunities they believe are best for them and their families. And they can be proud of their country and practice their faith in the way they desire. There are a few individuals with us I want to highlight tonight who embody what we hope for the Iranian people. Goli Amari came to the United States as a freshman at Stanford and has founded successful companies and has served at the State Department and at the UN. Susan Azadeda was forced to leave everything behind and come here in 1979. Today, she is the leader of the Iranian American Jewish Federation. Macon Del Rahim, I think I saw him, came to America with his family when he was just 10 years old. He's, he's, he's now the Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice. Quite amazing. We hope that the successes of Goli and Susan and Macon and the many other American, Iranian Americans among the diaspora in the United States remind all Iranians of what is possible under a government that respects its people and governs with accountability. Iranians should not have to flee their homeland to find a better life. <clears throat> While it is ultimately up to the Iranian people to determine the direction of their country, the United States, in the spirit of our own freedoms, will support the long ignored voice of the Iranian people. Our hope is that ultimately the regime will make meaningful changes in its behavior, both inside of Iran and globally. As President Trump has said, we're willing to, to talk with the regime in Iran, but relief from American pressure will come only when we see tangible, demonstrated, and sustained, sustained shifts in Tehran's policies. I thought I'd close tonight in a perfectly appropriate way by invoking the words of a man who routinely made the case for freedom and respect far more eloquently than I ever could, President Ronald Reagan. In 1982, in 1982, Pre President Reagan gave a speech to the British Parliament that became known as the Westminster Address. He urged other Western governments to support those around the world trying to break free of tyranny and injustice. His reason why was simple and powerful. He said, freedom is not the sole prerogative of a lucky few, but the inalienable right and universal right of every human being. This is why we also call on all governments to end their flirtations with a revolutionary regime and come quickly to the aid of the Iranian people. <laughs> on that same day, in those same remarks, President Reagan said, let us ask ourselves, what kind of people do we think we are? And let us answer, free people, worthy of freedom, and determined not only to remain so, but to help others gain their freedom as well. Today, the United States condemns oppression levied on the Iranian people by those who rule unjustly, and we proudly amplify the voices of those in Iran longing to have those inalienable and universal human rights cease to be ignored and instead to be honored. We do so knowing that many in the streets and marketplaces speak for those who the regime has permanently silenced over the years who may even have had loved ones who are in the audience tonight. It's America's hope that the next 40 years of Iran's history will not be marked by repression and fear, but with freedom and fulfillment for the Iranian people. Thank you. <laughs> we'll take another swing. Thank you.
Well, Mr. Secretary, <clears throat> I have some questions for you, but you actually answered almost <laughs> all of them quite eloquently. We'll see if I can uh, give the same answer when I'm not got remarks in front of me. <laughs> well, let me just start with this one. Is it realistic to think that the Iranian people will ever regain control of their country in what we would term the foreseeable future? Of course. Yeah, of course. I, uh, of course, you know, I, I, always, I always remind those who, who think it's not possible or think the time horizon will be uh, measured in centuries, not hours. Um, I always remind them that uh, th things change. There are disjunctive moments. There are times uh, when things happen that are unexpected, unanticipated. Our revolution would be one of them. I could go on. You all could name them, too. Um, we, we don't know the right moment. We don't know the day that that, that behavior of the Iranian regime will change. Um, but we do know the things... Uh, that the world is obligated to do uh, so that when the right time comes, when the right moment comes, uh, that opportunity is even more likely to find its fulfillment. Would you synthesize uh, your excellent speech and really uh, in a few words <clears throat> say what you think the best way to affect that change within the Iranian government is and how the Trump administration is helping the Iranian people in their struggle to become freed from this current tyrannical administration there. So, so President Trump has been absolutely unequivocal on this, not, not only in the message, but in the fact that this is a real priority for the administration as well. Uh, I think that's important. One could have a, uh, one could have a uh, objective, but if one doesn't rank it sufficiently high, um, attention spans are short and resources limited. The president has put this as uh, something he considers to be incredibly important. Uh, the, the mission set for our team is clear. Um, it's to deny uh, the Iranian leadership the resources, the wealth, the funds, the capacity uh, to continue to foment terrorism around the world and to um, deny the people inside of Iran the freedoms that they so richly deserve. How's that? 30 seconds. That's pretty good. <laughs> <clears throat> there is a perception among some that Iranians, including students and including legitimate visitors, can't obtain U.S. visas because of a travel ban. Would you clarify that what U.S. policy is regarding what we will call Iranian civil society visitors? Sure. I'd be happy to do that. Um, so President Trump has made clear with respect to a number of countries that weren't providing us with suffi sufficient information that we had risks of uh, American security, that we were going to do our best to work with those countries to develop the information that we needed. Iran continues to deny us the basic uh, data sharing systems that hundreds of countries, or excuse me, dozens and dozens of countries already provide us. We would like Iran to do that. Um, we still allow students to come in. There are many students. I'm sure there's students here tonight who are Iranians um, who are here studying. Um, we welcome that. Um, but this administration does have as one of its primary policies to make sure that we appropriately vet all those who come to the nation so that we can keep our country safe. That's the plan. That's the policy. Well, on perhaps an unduly optimistic note, what could be a basis for reconciliation between the United States and Iran? So it's always possible. Um, and the president's made clear, uh, the, the fact, I shouldn't have joked, the president's made clear he, he would love that. He would, he would welcome that. Um, I've now made three trips to Pyongyang, uh, a regime that is, has treated its citizens in a way that also uh, denies them their freedoms. And the president has said, if we can get this change, if we can get, if we can get the leadership to uh, make a strategic decision about how to ensure its well-being and the well-being of its peoples, that we're prepared to have a conversation and to discuss how that might proceed. The president has stated at least once, perhaps more than once, that he's prepared to do that with the leadership in Iran, um, but not until such time as there are demonstrable, tangible, irreversible changes in the Iranian regime that uh, I don't see happening today. Um, but I live in hope. And what 
would be your advice for students, hopefully many in the audience today, who will be interested in being part of that effort and seek a career at the State Department? How can they best prepare? And what challenges should they anticipate? Uh, so we welcome all hardworking, talented, patriotic folks to come be part of a great diplomatic team in the United States. Um, it's an incredible honor. I'm now 12 weeks almost to the day as the Secretary of State. Uh, the team is fantastic. Uh, my, my wisdom for them is no different than the same wisdom I gave my son. If he was here, he'd be rolling his eyes about now. <laughs> uh, you know, work hard, uh, study, tell the truth every place you go. Uh, uh, we have lots of folks who speak different languages, who have spent time in other countries, who have uh, been able to learn about other cultures. It's critically important that we get uh, that skill set at the State Department. Those are the kinds of things that young people who want a wonderful, exciting, uh, rewarding, important career working as an American diplomat ought to think about doing as they move their way through college and uh, beyond. Uh, and we're welcome. Go to state.gov. It's easy to find. Uh, we've got lots of great places for talented young Americans to come. Uh, be part of our great team. Well, Mr. Secretary, you have been quite clear. And it's, I think, clear to all of us who are privileged to be in this audience and in this house dedicated to the preservation and the uh, enhancement of the Ronald Reagan legacy that you understand it better than perhaps anybody I've come across in a long time. We, uh, I think, both remember <clears throat> that at a critical time in the history of this country, he said with a smile, trust but verify. <laughs> and it seems to me that's your message very clearly. And we thank you for the distinguished service that you have given from the moment that you left the point, number one in your class. I find that quite impressive. <laughs> and whoever that opponent was against whom you were playing basketball <laughs> at Los Amigos, I think he would have to say when he said, well, he made the most of what he could. <laughs> You've made the most of a very generous helping from the good Lord of brains <laughs> and courage and directness. We are lucky to have you. Thank you, Pete. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. Well, it's sincere. That's very, very kind. Thank you, sir. Please. Go ahead.